In the matter of the people of the state of California versus Orenthal James Simpson, case number BA097. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for Boom. your Boom, and we are off. Taylor, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I am good. I'm going to do something I never do, which is I'm going to introduce the show. Um, oh. Instead of forgetting, uh, we are doomed to fail. I'm Fars, joined here by Taylor, who just did a trip, a little round trip from where she's at to Los Angeles to see the amazing Dan Carlin. Taylor, how how is Dan? In- incredible. I... I'm still like, my face is very pink from yesterday playing baseball all day, but um, it was uh, literally a blur. I like went with my friend, Nicole. I got like five. We had dinner and then we went down. It was in downtown LA, which, you know, I would avoid if I could at any cost, but I would go for Dan Carlin in a beautiful theater down there, somewhere down there. And um, it was hilarious. It was like 95% dudes. And they all looked exactly the same. Nicole was like, everyone here seems familiar. I was like, they're exactly the same, Nicole. It's just like, the, just exactly who you think. And it was great. And um, the show was great. It was two hours of Dan just like talking to another guy about the future, about AI, about how we can use history to talk about the past, about the different things, you know, just like a conversation. Um, and then I asked him a question in front of everybody. I said, Taylor from Doom to Fail podcast. I was wearing my Doomed to Fell shirt. Nicole and I put the stickers everywhere. Um, not like stuck to things, but like around. Um, oh my gosh. And then it was it was so fun. And then afterwards, we went to the bar next door. And then he came to the bar next door. And I like, ju- this is like several glasses of wine made me do this. But I like jumped up and like went to his table. And I like put my hand on his back. And I was like, Dad, I'm so sorry. But I'm just so excited. He goes, oh, did you ask the 9-11 question? I was like, I did. That's the 9-11 question. Um, and then we talked a little bit about like history and our kids. And I gave him our sticker. And he said, I'll check it out. And it was just amazing. Did you get a picture? No. And he was like at a table with like four other people. And I just like bothered him. Um, what was your question? Um, well, I asked about... Um, things that are happening now that are going to be history later. So he had talked about like, you know, the Bay of Pigs and things that were happening in in, like the early 1900s slash like ancient history. And I was like, well, what about stuff like, because you talk about 9-11 kind of in the same category as those things as a major historical event, but I'm here with my friend Nicole and we were there together. So Nicole and I couldn't go home for a couple of weeks because we left our house after the second plane hit the second tower. So like, what do, how like what, what am I supposed to do to make sure that my part of history, like is remembered the way I want it to be? How do, what do I do about that? And so he, you know, he was like, well, we should learn from you and from people who are there. And it was just very nice. And it was very exciting. So recommendation, go see Dan Carlin if you can live. I mean, duh. I wouldn't say not to do that. So is it, it, it was an interview style? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I have no idea who the other guy was. He introduced himself. They had known each other for a while. Oh, dude. But um, Nicole and I were like, we should go to the bathroom. There's not going to be a line. <laughs> like, you know, that never happens for ladies at events. So it was, yeah. it was funny. So um, it yeah, out. it was wonderful. Yeah. Nice. Nice. So I don't know. So we'll see. But we met a guy at the at the bar afterwards. And he was like, oh, yeah. He was like, I was going to check your podcast after you talked. And I was like, great. I don't know. I thought that might be fun. So hopefully we get a couple more listeners from it, too. Because I know those people would like it. All of the the Dan Carlin fans. I mean, mm-hmm. we're like. Zero percent of Dan Carlin in in a thing. You know what I mean? Like, well, if you, we like, reference him a lot. Exactly, exactly. Like, if you like Dan Carlin but are kind of dumb, <laughs> come on over. <laughs> you know, you know, Taylor, you were doing so good at the marketing until that <laughs> that line. I just, I don't want anybody to think that I'm like comparing our show to Dan Carlin show because that would be ridiculous. Now I'm actually no. very hot. And I don't know where I put my fan, um, but no, it, it was just, it was very very fun, and I have not recovered. Well, that is a great way to spend a Thursday night. So it is. you drove back Thursday night or? I drove back Friday morning and um, I got home by like 9.30, but I left really early. Yeah, you probably have to. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cool. Well, that sounds yeah. like that's very, very exciting. It's very exciting then than my week last week. I did not see Dan Carlin. Um, so that'd be, that'd be real be... fucked up if you were there and you didn't say hi to me. <laughs> If I just stood up to and was like, I'm far from doomed to fail. It's like, do you guys know each other or something? I'm far as also from doomed to fail. And you're also wearing a t-shirt with both of our faces on it. <laughs> <laughs> like, 
I don't know her. <laughs> um, just totally different person. Um, sweet. Well, let's go ahead and dive in. Uh, I think I go first today. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Are you using your cell phone to fan yourself with? I am. I should get like an actual fan. I should put my fan on. Um, I'm not going to use just my cell phone case to fan my face with. I um, think all I need to put is on, on screen. It was, I spent a lot of time outside yesterday. Keep going. <laughs> Wait, you put what on screen? I need to put on sunscreen because oh. yesterday I had two baseball games, you know, for the kids. And it was so windy. I had like dirt in my teeth. It was just like the windiest day. They were like, we had to stop a game because of a tumbleweed. Like that's the, how windy it was. So. I mean, you got to love you gotta love the South. I do recall yeah. driving around when I was living in Lubbock and seeing tumbleweed cross the street like in Old Western. Mm-hmm. And I was like, that's kind of fun. Yeah, they're everywhere. So it was fun. But yes, go ahead. Tell me a story. So Ready? I, <clears throat> so I'm gonna cover a really kind of like interesting old timey fun doom to fail concept. Um, it is the most doom to fail concept I can possibly imagine. Um, it is going to it it has to do with a line of ships from the olden era that were all essentially doomed to fail. I'm Did you say covering... old, olden era? Olden era. Is that that's not an era. Like it's, olden it's olden times era. <laughs> All right, keep going. I'm covering the White White Star Line Olympic class of ships, but I'm not going to mm-hmm. cover the most famous one because that one's going to death, so who, who cares? Um, so I'm mostly covering the other two, but like, whatever. If we want to talk about the most famous one, we certainly can. Obviously, everybody knows that the most famous one is the Titanic. But I'm going to basically focus on the rest of them because they're all kind of in the same class of just like doomed vessels um and is, it's pretty was one of them lusitania is that one of them nope okay. lusitania is going to come up but not in this context we should do that someone should do that one sometime because that one's real good yeah yeah so wait wait can i guess their names is one of them the olympic yes yes what's the other one uh, is it the one that found the titanic the carpathia or no no okay can you have a hint look at um, we, when we were kids, people would sell encyclopedias that were, oh, were Britannica. Listening. there you go. I mean, that was easy, but yes. well, it, it was Britannic, but the, but the books are Britannica. Yes. Close enough. Thank you. Same, same. Okay. All right. Fine. I'm opening a root beer. Go for That's it. What is. Keep going. So we're covering the limit class of ships. So basically these are like classifications when, when ships are being designed and built, you don't build a one of a kind. You create like a template, like an archetype, and then you build them to that spec based on the type of ship you're current, trying to create. And for the White Star Line, that was the Olympic class of ships. So there's three of them. We're going to get into that in a minute. And your ship is about to come up as well. So in 1906, uh, White Star Line's biggest competitor was a shipping company, also a British one, called Cunard Line. And mm-hmm. they had launched some flagship vessels called the Mortania and the Lusitania which you just referenced um, at a time when they launched, they basically took the rain as being the fastest and most luxurious ships across the Atlantic. And at the time, the white star line had four ships known as the big four, all of which were pretty young. They were only a few years old at this time. The oldest one was about five years old and it was called the Celtic. The youngest ship actually launched a year after the Mauritania Lusitania launch that was called the um, the Adriatic that launched in 1907, but because this new round of ships were coming out, this new class from Cunard White Star wanted to compete and have the biggest, best, fastest, most luxurious, safest ships possible, and mm-hmm. so they went to their shipbuilder, a company that is still in, in operation today, called Harlan and Wolf in Belfast, Ireland, and asked them to come up with a concept. They cool. came up with this class of ships. The original three ships that were part of this class were in ascending order when they re- launched the RMS Olympic in 1910, the RMS Titanic, which we all know in 1911, the HMHS Britannic in 1914. Those are the three classes of ships. Okay. I think you're. I think I know what you're going to ask. Well, well, you just said three classes. Are those just three ships or no? Yeah, it was, just, it was three. They're all the Olympic class ships, and those are the three that fit into Got it. it. Okay. Wait, were there four? Did you say there were no, four? There were, no, there was. So what happened was, 
I'm going to go into this, but White Star basically, like, the whole concept of doing transatlantic movements of people via massive ships stopped being relevant. And so no additional plans were made for, for more, more ships in this class. What I thought you might ask me was, what does RMS and HMHS mean? Because I had no idea what that meant. So, uh, Is it Royal Majesty Ship? Royal Mail Her Ship. Majesty Ship? Royal Mail Ship. Okay. Yeah. So RMS is Royal Mail Ship, which means that it carried mail. And HMHS is His Majesty's Hospital Ship. Huh. And apparently you should only have those designations when you're doing those things. When you're not doing those things, you're supposed to go by SS, which would which stood for screw steamer. Okay. But it's the same thing. But like if I'm on the Titanic and I have a letter in my pocket, am I a mail ship? <laughs> You might need more than one letter, but you could be. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so... The, it didn't the term, get there. It didn't get there. So the term yeah. screw is just like... It, it, it's, it means it's a prop engine. And it's a steamer. It's steam power. That's basically the only... Point oh, I've it. I've seen the engines. You've seen I've what? Seen those. You know, the one when the guy falls on the propeller at the Titanic? Taylor, I'm going to admit something. I actually stayed home last night and watched Titanic. Oh my god! Did you? I'm never going to watch it again. I don't have the emotional capacity. But um, how? What did you think? <laughs> I I fast forwarded all the like sappy stuff because I really that I wasn't there for the sappy stuff. I was there for the tragedy. Mm -hmm. Have you seen the the? the great. Have you seen the things where you know he when he shows her his like sketchbook? And she's yeah. Looking at, like the ladies, but like where they and like Instagram, they'll like cut it and it'll be like Pokemon cards. <laughs> not too or like or like a drawing of someone doing that like s that like all the kids draw you know oh like, yeah forget it and she's like the, yay and he's like real proud of himself <laughs> the chain link s's yeah oh um, my gosh no it was it was it was fun to rewatch. but then like the other thing i noticed is that so much of the movie was cgi obviously it probably i mean it had to be mm -hmm. you don't you didn't notice it when you were like younger watching it and now you watch it and it's like so obviously like bad but yeah, you know, they did the best they could. So we're I mean, gonna we start. I mean, yeah, yeah, of course. You, it won every award. Yeah, so, so much damage, emotional damage. Uh, so the Olympic. I'm gonna start with the Olympics. I'm gonna go in like ascending order. So the Olympic had the longest life of all the Olympic class ships, going into service in 1911 and retiring in 1935 with 24 year with a 24 year service cycle. One thing I learned, because I actually watched up a ton of other ships, because every time you start researching this stuff, it leads you to, like, the Cunard line of ships. What was Germany doing? What was America doing? And all this. And it was mm -hmm. weird. All these steamers had these, like, crazy low lifespans. Like, you would assume if you spend right. the equivalent of hundreds of millions of dollars on these things, they would have to live for many multiples of decades. Most of them didn't. Most of them, like, 24 years was kind of, like, it. Like that was like you were lucky to get 24 years out of one of these things, which is kind of surprising. But <laughs> there you have it. Uh, Olympic and Titanic, they were actually built side by side in that Belfast um, shipping company's yard. And Olympic actually finished first and almost immediately started having accidents. Like, I don't know what was going, what funeral ground or grave site this, this thing was built on, but immediately they started having accidents there. So I have a thousand questions. Can I raise my hand? I'm so sorry. You're going to regret yes. that. No, no, please. Um, are you going to go into conspiracy theories about the Olympic and the Titanic? No, I'm not going into that. So I've heard that maybe they were switched because the um, Olympic was like falling apart. So they switched it and pretended it was a Titanic because they knew it wasn't going to make it. One. Two. This isn't a conspiracy theory. This is question number two. How do you make a ship that big? What's the, What do you start with? Like the outline? Yeah. So you like start with, yeah, you start with laying the keel, which is like the one through line, the backbone of the ship, the thing that kind of breaks in half when Titanic breaks, for example, that's, uh -huh. it's all held together by the keel and then the keel eventually rips as well. You start there and then you build it from the hull, at, hull inward. And so what happens usually is once the thing is built up with the bolt bones, and the scaffolding of it, you can take it out of dry dock and start assembling it because at that point it can float. And that's when you start fitting it with all of its luxury stuff on the interior. That's kind of the, the mm -hmm. way they did it back then, at least. 
also I mean, earlier it's, it's overwhelming to me to build like pieces of it obviously when, that's not my job even close yeah, so so when it, with, 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 i learned a little bit about this so like when they got this commission to build these ships they had to they basically have to like redo their entire construction methods because mm -hmm. every ship is bigger than the last ship so the dry dock for example you had originally would have to be destroyed and a new dry dock would have to be built that would accommodate it, it was wild it was like the whole thing had like a new company was basically being created or new process being created every time a new ship was being commissioned so what is the Kinder, their Cunard lines is that what you said or no is it the white star white star so what does white star do they just pay for it white star is the operator yeah what does that mean? so white star is the company that sells the tickets that staffs mm, okay. the employee staffs the ship and does all that they are the operator like it's like american airlines oh that totally makes sense because i'm also i think i'm also really really flustered because i'm about to take an american airlines boeing flight to japan and i am going to need to be sedated i mean i just did too i just i got back from charleston like two two nights ago and i was mm. on a boeing plane and was like i'm just gonna I'm just gonna listen to them when they tell me to keep my seatbelt on. <laughs> like, <laughs> but that, but that totally makes sense, and I get it. Thank you for answering that question for me. You are not totally off about that first conspiracy theory, though. So, sort of. So, like, so like a, a lightweight version of it, like a diet version of it. So, um, what happened was immediately after the Olympic was launched, we started having these accidents. So, the, and all of them are actually tied to Titanic in some way. So, for example, its first accident was it was going through this strait in the UK and another ship was docked alongside this strait. And given the size of Olympic, its draft and its weight was enough to snap the line holding that ship in place. And the bow of that ship collided with Olympic. And it was bad. Like I looked at pictures of this, like that ship was very, very badly damaged. Um, it was, it's mm -hmm. called the Hawk, if you want to look it up. Um, and the, the, the Olympic stayed a float. Go ahead. Have you ever seen a boat launching? Yeah. Even they just that's like crazy. hip it off the thing. They just like hope for the best. Yeah. So they actually big thing. I forgot what it was. It was like they used like 200,000 tons of like lard and like oil to like launch Titanic or something. I forgot what it was. Like it took a lot of grease and stuff to get it out, out to actually open water. Um, but the point being that when Olympic had this collision, it had to be sent back to be repaired in Belfast. And mm -hmm. that took eight weeks. And because they were desperately trying to get this thing operational, because every day the thing's in dry dock, it's losing money, right? It's not revenue generating. Sure. And so they're like, do this thing as fast as possible. Titanic was still a ways from launching. And they're like, just scrap, take the parts from Titanic and use them to rebuild Olympic. And so that's what they did. Mm -hmm. So they have like pieces of each other, probably. Exactly. In real life. Yeah, the exactly. hawk is 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 fucked up. It got yeah. it got crushed. Yeah. So that all happened in on November 20th. Um when uh, November 20th, 1911 is when Olympic returned back to service. It only took three months for her to have another accident. And I mean this case wasn't an accident, it's more like something went wrong. Basically, it lost its propeller blade in the ocean. And at that point, they had to return it back to the builder and again scavenge parts from the Titanic. So ultimately, what ended up happening was this delayed the inaugural voyage of Titanic by about three weeks, which <gasps> made it colder. No, we should yeah. would have made it warmer. It was going to the summer. Well, if you think about it in terms of like time and space, maybe that iceberg wouldn't have been there. Yeah, 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 right. yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, hundred percent. I mean, yes, hundred percent. It would not have been there. <laughs> it's almost impossible. I, mean, I don't know. Do icebergs move that fast? Or like they wouldn't have been. It wouldn't have happened. In three weeks, I think the iceberg probably would have moved. In three weeks. I don't know how fast icebergs move. I'm not going to look it up because that's not what we're talking about. That is not what we're talking about. We'll later. Okay. So, in 1915, at the height of World War I, she was retrofitted from pastor service to military uh, usage with the addition of deck guns. And also, it was, original capacity was somewhere around 3,000 pastors. It expanded to 6,000 soldiers. So, like, they basically did away with all the pretty stuff and was like just yeah yeah like none of the niceties needed to be there in 1919 she encountered a german u-boat and rammed it apparently this u-boat was lining up to try and attack it and torpedo it and the ship accelerated into it and tore a massive hull into 
the side of this U-boat. The crew ended up scuttling it and abandoning abandoning the, the ship. Uh, nine people were killed. Nine of the crew were killed on that one. 31 were saved when a U.S. vessel spotted their distress signal. I don't know what the situation was, but I guess Britain was, was taking no Nazi uh, – or they weren't Nazis back then. I guess they were taking no German survivors mm-hmm. at that time. So, Wait, so no one on the Olympic died? Yeah, no, this is all died. U-boat people. All the U-boat okay. people, yeah. So the Olympic, yeah, they, it hit this thing, knew it hit it, knew that it was scuttling itself, and it just kept going mm-hmm. like, screw it, whoever finds you, finds you. Um, so this actually gives the Olympic the distinction of being the only civilian vessel to ever sink a U-boat during the war, which is kind of cool. So that is very fun, cool. for, fun for the Olympic. Uh, in 1918, the war ended and it was uh, the Olympic was returned back to commercial service. It was restored. It was able to carry passengers again. It looked pretty again. Um, it's interesting because there's some things that if you look at on the Titanic, it's actually not the Titanic. It's the Olympic. So any fo- any pictures right, you see. Okay, then mm-hmm, keep going. That, I think where, that's a conspiracy, that, like the windows and stuff. Yeah, yeah, that, that's part of the conspiracy. Okay. So, like, for example, if you were to see the Grand Staircase, the Titanic's, like, coolest feature, I guess, or one of the most talked oh, about I features. That. I know, we've I know all seen that right. movie. <laughs> we've all seen it. Um, I'm going to have such Titanic nightmares. And the nightmares aren't going to be about Titanic. They're going to be about my life in the 90s. <laughs> in the 90s? <laughs> oh, Honestly, yeah. I just, like, can't even when talk about it. it. It, like, messed with, mess with my brain. Yeah, keep going. <laughs> um... But, for example, the Grand Staircase pictures you see of Titanic, those actually aren't Titanic. Those are all Olympic. So they were very, what? very similar in that <clears throat> regard. And that's part of where your conspiracy theory that you originated <laughs> comes from. I might as well have. Um, Just kidding. So this thing goes into pasture commercial use again in 1918. In later years, basically what ended up happening was that the Great Depression hit uh, the need and desire for luxury travel was diminished and also the need and want to travel to the united states in general was kind of diminished that was also around the time when the u.s passed um additional limitations on the number of uh immigrants it would accept Mm -hmm. in the country and so as a result less and less people were wanting to even go there so Mm -hmm. that gradually led to a decline in service Uh, i forgot what year was i didn't write it down but it, it was something around like the preceding three or four years before they decided to give it up on olympic uh mm-hmm. it had not turned a profit like basically it was losing money every every time it operated essentially mm-hmm. in 1934 under pressure from the british government white star line and cunard merged to form cunard white star and basically they joined forces because both of them were running low on money because of all the issues that i mentioned above and white uh, cunard had already laid the keel in the hull for the queen mary and the queen elizabeth but couldn't afford to finish it and the British government was like, we're not going to fund this. Y'all definitely need to stay in business. So merge and we'll help facilitate um, that merger to assist you to complete these ships. And so that was mm-hmm. basically what they did. Uh, ultimately, uh, the Olympic was sold for 97,000 pounds, which is the equivalent of 8.2 million pounds today. This feels super low. Yeah. <laughs> like, it was like but, cool stuff. Still. Yeah. Yeah. You just sold it the way it was. Yeah. And um, basically what ended up happening was that because of the economic downturn that happened after the war, uh, this was purchased by a lord or baron or whatever, like some one of those guys, some rich guy. And uh, he transported it to this city that was specifically having like significant economic issues so that the he could hire the citizens of the city to basically scrap it. And so that's what he did. Um, the city was called Jaro and he brought it to Jaro and basically hired this massive staff of people to discard this thing and scrap it. That was how do idea. you do that? How do you start with that? That's another question. Because remember how we've talked about like older ships, how they just like leave them on the beach? Yeah. You know, like, I mean, where do you start with that? Like, I'm going to take out the carpet, I guess. And then they so, can take out the doors. I, I bet you, would, given the fact that a lot of the Olympic, the in, ret, inter, interior fittings of it ended up, uh, so right now, there's places you can go and see parts of the Olympic. So, for example, there's a celebrity cruise ship that has an Olympic cafe. And the sidings and the panelings of this room that this cafe is in, that's all pulled out from the Olympic. And so that's what they did. They basically went in uh, room by room, took pieces of it out, 
and then sold those to anybody who wanted like this beautiful luxury fitting. And then the metal you just basically pull apart across the rivets and sell for scrap metal. That's basically it. So one terrifying and also fun fact about the Olympic. So in 1929, it was traveling over the exact last known location of the Titanic. You know, that route is very well traveled. Like there's, I, I looked at one of them, like that's where all the ships go. It's the exact same route. And it was right over the last known location of Titanic when it started shuddering violently for about two minutes, scaring the absolute living shit out of everybody. Um, yeah, that's ghosts. That's 100% ghosts. Literally wrote, unfortunately, it wasn't ghosts. I don't believe <laughs> I, you. I have it right here in the outline. Nope, it was ghosts. Um, no, I believe that you but, wrote that, but I don't believe you that it's not ghosts. <laughs> unfortunately, what actually ended up happening was a massive 7.2 magnitude earthquake had struck about 400 miles away from this spot and had yeah. caused it to, yeah. An earthquake caused by ghosts. An earthquake probably caused by ghosts. Okay. So we both then uh, agree to agree. We're, we're on the same page. So the next ship that was launched was the obvious one. Do we need to talk about this at all? Does anybody, does, is anybody ambiguous about like what the Titanic was or what happened to it? Um, I hope, I hope not. Okay. I'm sure everyone knows. I'm Do you sure want to give knows. us a, a quick a quick one? A quick run through? Big ship hit iceberg, sank, 1,500 people died, 700 were saved. That's it. I do have a story about a couple who died on the Titanic that I do want to tell someday. But it involves, it's not about the Titanic itself. So, anyway, that's all. All right. Well, uh, nice little cliffhanger. Um, I'm not going to spoil it. <laughs> join us next be. week for. It's not next week. It'll be someday. Um, so let's go to the third ship. So the third ship uh, has a pretty fascinating life. So this is the Britannic. Uh, it, like the other two ships, was essentially designed as a pasture liner and then immediately mm-hmm. entered war service, given that it launched right at the start of World War One. I. I didn't know this, mm-hmm. but I guess like. Back then, Britain could just, like, take your stuff. So, like, they would just go to White, White Star and be like, this isn't your pastor ship anymore. This is our ship. Yeah, I think I also knew that because, like, well, I think I don't think that's exclusive to Britain because I think in other other ships that we've talked about, you know, they, they you know, become ships for war and then go back to their owners or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, also, it's worth noting that, like, you probably don't want to take a pasture cruise across the Atlantic when there's U-boats and submarines, like, sinking everything in, in the way. So and That's what happened probably, to Lusitania. Yeah. Yeah, they probably didn't want to actually do this, so it was probably a, a godsend for them. Um, but this ship entered service as a hospital ship. That's why I mentioned earlier it had the distinction of HMHS. The HS in that is hospital ship. So... Because of the Titanic sinking, the original design for Britannic, which was, again, this Olympic class design that was supposed to be uniform across the board, ended up changing. So part of what they did was they expanded the length of the double hull um, to go alongside the engine room and also raised the watertight bulkheads higher than the Titanic had them. The theory being the higher those are, the less likely they are to spill over to the next one and cause flooding. I still haven't heard what the rationale is for not making the top of these things like water t- I, I don't get it like what happened with right. titanic was like it dipped low and so water would spill from one top to the next top to the next i was like yeah why wouldn't why wouldn't that always happen like why would you ever assume that wouldn't be the case i don't get it right like why don't you just seal up the whole thing right i don't know okay i was literally was just watching a video of that happening on Instagram recently because it's the thing. Yeah. If you're a ship historian. Please, please write to us at doomedfellpod at gmail.com. So basically this ship had a lot more safety features than Titanic had. They learned a lot from Titanic essentially. And so good. I mean, yeah, well this one, for example, had enough life rafts and stuff like that. So, um, at 8.12 a.m. on November 21st, 1916, a little less than a year after it originally officially went into service, uh, she struck a mine in the Keech Channel, which is like around the UK. And I guess mm-hmm. like this is what this is what the U-boats would do is just go around and just put mines up everywhere in the shipping lanes, which is like terrifying. <laughs> Can you imagine? Like who went back and found those? 
Okay. I have a really crazy story about landmines. This is not, this is weird. Okay. I'm just gonna tell you. I'm sorry. Um, there's this band that the kids like called Perry Grip. It like, it's like a band that plays like kid songs, but like funny. And one of them is about these hero rats, it's like hero rats saving people's lives. And I was like, some of them are about true, about true stories, like a monkey on a Segway. Not a true story. You know, that They saw a video of it and they made the song. But the song about the hero rats, I was like, maybe that's true. And I looked it up and there's places in the world where there are landmines and they've trained giant rats to find them. And the rats are not big enough to set them off, but they can find them and then people can go and turn them off. Isn't that cool? Well, what do you do in the ocean? I have no idea. But I'm just telling you, I, I know I know that this thing about giant rats. It's dolphins. So we should make a movie or write a book about like a plane crashing in the Atlantic and then as it crashes it hits like a World War II landmine. Can you imagine how, how much bad luck that would be? It'd be so much bad luck in one one sitting. Oh, yeah. So this is where we are. We're in 1916 November. <clears throat> this thing strikes a landmine planted by a U-boat. The watertight doors were ordered sealed, but apparently the bulkhead in two of them was damaged to the point where the doors couldn't actually come down. Like they're like, you know, there's steel girders that just twisted. Um, regardless mm -hmm. of that, the ship could stay afloat with five of the com compartments completely flooded. Uh, and given the fact that two were non-operational, not a big deal. We'll just flood those two, have those two flooded, and the, the rest of the five will keep this thing afloat. That was the idea. And that mm -hmm. was actually a safety feature ahead of the Titanic. I forgot what it was. I think Titanic was only four could be flooded. And then it hit five, and that's what caused it to go down so fast. Actually, it didn't go that, hmm. down that fast. It took like two hours and 40 minutes. So the problem here, even though it was just five compartments flooded, was that a nurse who worked on the ship wanted to ventilate the floor that she was on or the deck that she was on. And she had mm -hmm. left the porthole window open, despite the fact that there was a standing order that you could never leave these vessels, portholes open. And so water started flooding and this thing was listing because it was only hit on one side. So five compartments filled, it listed to one side. It dropped below the water line of this one porthole on the first deck that had portholes in it. And water just started flooding wow. in through there. That was it. Wow. Yeah. So the captain at that point uh, didn't know how bad the situation was. He ordered that the ship be steered towards nearby land in, the, in an attempt to basically run out of ground. Uh, the explosion was in the bow, which lifted the rudder and propellers like out of the water, ultimately out of the water. So it was the same way the Titanic kind of ended up before it snapped in half. Um, as a result mm -hmm. of this, it made maneuvering it incredibly difficult because your manner of maneuver in the propeller and rudder are not totally in the water. So, right. At this point, the captain had yet to order lifeboats um, to be uh, launched. But despite this, third officer, a guy named Francis Laws, decided to do this on his own against the captain's orders. He ended up lowering two yes. lifeboats filled with people. And An absolute hero. You want to hear how this ends? No. Is it, did he do something wrong? Because that's exactly what you should do is not listen to your boss and get the fuck out. Continue. Uh, listen, listen closer to see if Taylor's correct. So. Oh, God. Again, the captain was trying to steer this thing to an island to run it ashore to limit the potential loss of life. So the propellers were still moving. But he, like I said, the front of the ship, the mm. bow, was coming was going deeper into the water. What happens when that happens? The stern and the propellers go higher in the water. And mm -hmm. they were partially out of the water as these lifeboats were being launched. And as a result, they ended up sucking the lifeboats into <gasps> the spinning propeller blades and killing 30 people on them. Oh. So, so should we listen to Taylor's advice or? I mean, we absolutely should always. You should always just leave because if you're in a burning building and you don't leave because your boss tells you to stay, I think you should leave. Okay. I'm going to say that. Yeah. Okay. I'm not going to some... stop my like thing that I stand by. I mean, that sucks, but also worth a shot. <laughs> yeah, I guess worth a shot. Well, the, the sad part of that is that the only 30 people that died were those people and there was 1066 people on the on the ship and 1036 survived so um that was kind of uh where that ended up so they the reason there were so many more survivors were several very very obvious reasons one was the titanic sank in 28 degree water i read this that like 
if you survive 15 minutes in 28 degree water, water, you are incredibly lucky biologically. Like you should not be able to like several minutes should be enough to kill you in 28 degree water. Um, in the case of Britannic, it sank in 68 degree water, which is like much more, I mean, it would still suck, but it's much more survivable. The other incredibly obvious thing was again, lessons learned from Titanic. They actually had the right amount of lifeboats on this ship. And so actually, actually mm -hmm. had as many lifeboats as it needed for the passenger load that it was carrying. And so everybody was on the boat. And mm -hmm. the other thing well, they was got a, that, did they get a lifeboats eventually then? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so when, when it was obvious, so what happened was things started capsizing. Because again, it was hit on one side, so one half was getting flooded. It started capsizing. And by that point, when the rudders came out of the water and the propeller came out of the water, the captain was like, I can't steer this. And also, they mm -hmm. suspect that his desire to try and run this thing aground was actually causing it to flood way faster than it would have ordinarily. So like I said before, Titanic ended up being totally flooded and sinking at about two hours and 40 minutes after striking the iceberg. In this case, it only took 55 minutes. So they think that the fact that he was trying to get this thing to land was rushing, forcing mm. water in faster. Um, and so it became obvious to him at some point that he had to abandon ship, which is what he did. So the wreckage itself um, is actually only 400 feet in the water. It was discovered in 1975 by Jacques Cousteau. It came to rest on its side and holds the distinction of being the largest pasture liner to sink, which is pretty cool. Um, there have been man dives down to the wreck with some going all the way inside of this thing, which sounds absolutely terrifying. <laughs> like, Okay, like, I have a big question now. Why not just do that instead of try to go to the Titanic? Can't you be like, close enough to the experience, but I can like go in it? That sounds so scary. You think it's scary? I don't, I'm not saying no. That, that's like what they would love to do if they were able to do it. God, I'm getting scared in this room. Careful. I'm just thinking about it. Think. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think, I mean, that's, I was actually like thinking about this. So I was like, why is it that Titanic has such a draw to people? Like, what is like so unique about it that like it's still 110 years later, people are still killing themselves to go down there. I don't, I don't totally get it. So, I mean, I'm, I'm with you. Um, there's got to be something there. I don't totally understand it. But despite that, that doesn't mean that people aren't dying in this thing either. So, so far, two oh. people have died going into the wreck. Um, because I mean, like our other advice, like don't go into a sea cave. Yeah. It it's just so, I don't know what it is about this stuff. It, it just like haunts me. <laughs> like, I don't know if it's That's just, fine. if it's a me thing, but it's so scary. If you look at wreckage of this thing, it's like, can you imagine going down and being like, I'm going to go inside this thing. Like it's unbelievable. Um, so that's where it is. And as for the owners of it, so in 1947, 13 years after that merger I mentioned earlier, Cunard ended up buying out all of White Star Line's interest in the joint operation, about a 38% interest in the merge business. And that essentially just ended White Line's um, existence. So there is... Mm -hmm. There's, there's a, I'll discuss what the concept of White Line currently means, but there's not like a company called White Star Line. So in 1999, Cunard was sold to Carnival, and Carnival basically retained the brand as, as its like premium luxury brand and operates the Queen Mary II, Queen Victoria, and Queen mm -hmm. Elizabeth. Um, the flavor of these are very much upmarket and like not tacky. If you look up these ships, like they don't look like these stupid ships that you see right now with like giant, like, you know, water parks on them and stuff like that they're like very mm -hmm. much meant for like an upscale clientele their event cruises for example include literal like literature festivals at sea and symphony orchestra cruises so like that's their their vibe um and so as it relates to the white star brand so cunard as its own brand under carnival they have certain concepts we refer to as like white star so for example they're um officer training program is called white star white star program or school or something some academy or something like that it's so like they, they retain some vestiges of the brand and the name but as far as like a company mm -hmm. right now it's um it's not really it's not really a thing anymore so that's my story what'd you think interesting i like it um i can't believe that like there was i can't believe that like just it all went so poorly for all of them yeah. You know, 
it's like not just one, but like all, all of them, it went poorly for. That's really bizarre. Which actually was, I thought about this because one, I think it's Kira, right? Wrote to Mm-hmm. us and brought up the uh, Queen Mary, which I think is, or I mean, it definitely was docked in Long Beach, California. And I started looking into that. And so thank you for your recommendation, Kira. But then I sort of like, again, these things just take you down these weird winding roads. And I was like, what else was there with like, everybody talks about Titanic, like what else was there? And I started going into this. It's like, oh, okay. Like there's like a rich history that overlaps with World War One. It overlaps with the Great Depression. It overlaps like Yeah. with Mm hmm a lot of stuff, which is kind of interesting. Well, the Queen Mary is definitely still there because I was there, I was in LA and like before Halloween and for whatever reason it was Shaq was like the host of Shacktober at the Queen Mary. That's right. You And said it was they like don't Halloween do slash Shaq. we well, said they don't do the um the Halloween tours anymore, right? Well, I don't know. They probably do. If it was Shacktober, I'm sure they do. No. I thought you said, we talked about that before and you're like they some company bought it and decided not to do it anymore. Um No, I don't think so, but I don't know. But at least they were doing it last October. Nice. Nice. Um so yeah, that's my story. Um if you want to dive into conspiracy theories taylor just gave us a pretty good one which is something i'm probably gonna look into but um tbd Cool, cool. so Um, cool. I have do you have any I have a little bit of I do. I have some listener mail. okay Um, so this is from Morgan. Do you remember last week when I was like, "Oh, that guy Robert Reich who's always on the internet"? yeah Okay. Well, I'm an idiot, and I want you to tell me. I want to tell you everyone that now I know who he is. And let me just read from his Wikipedia page. Robert Reich is his quote from Wikipedia. He's an American professor, author, lawyer, and political commentator. He worked in the administrations of Presidents Gerald Ford and Jimmy Carter and served as Secretary of Labor from 1993-1997 in the cabinet of Bill Clinton. He was also a member of President Barack Obama's Economic Transition Advisory Board. Blah, 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 blah. He's very, very accomplished, and I'm dumb for not knowing who he was. No, it's fine. I I mean, we don't. apologize to the world. We, Now it's I okay. know. Now you know. He's um, he was part of the, yeah, he was part of like this interesting. There's a cohort of political consultants that like I am infinitely fascinated with, and he was part of. He's part of like that universe that is just like this old hat statesman, you know, like like just very much like steeped in like almost like a historian. as much as Mm a -hmm. politician and so yeah absolutely that's exactly right that's exactly right so you can like see what's going on now and be like whoa 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 wait so somebody america wrote to you and described to you who he is i mean my friend morgan told me who he was oh she's okay a friend got it but she got was it you know wasn't a stranger but i'm sure people were thinking it thank so i just you wanted for to not let you know lambasting taylor thank you um Sweet. Well, Sweet. again, write to us at doomedofellpod at gmail.com. Find us on all the socials. We'll go ahead and cut this off and rejoin you in a few days. Cool. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Taylor.